and uh, we're jumping into week two of a series we called Nope. Nope exists because there are some things that are better left avoided. For example, how about this guy? Anybody want to face off with uh, a grizzly bear? You can go ahead and say it. <laughs> nope. I'm good. A grizzly bear is a mean cuss. I'm telling you, man, those teeth, those claws. The, this one is seven feet tall. He's 400 pounds. That bear right there. Would you believe I was 18 inches from a grizzly bear once? Separated by two inches of acrylic, graciously <laughs> provided by the St. Louis Zoo just a few days ago. But I'm telling you what, man, if you want to hear me scream in a high pitch like a munchkin, just wait for one of these bad boys to just come out at you on the wild. In fact, the uh, Department of Fish and Game uh, at one point wanted to advise hikers, hunters, fishermen to take extra precautions and be alert for bears when they're in the field. And so they made this rather lighthearted posting. I'll read it to you. They said, we advise that outdoorsmen wear small bells on their clothing so as not to startle bears that aren't expecting them and to carry pepper spray with them in case of an encounter. Also, it's a good idea to watch for fresh signs of bear activity like bear droppings and to learn the difference between the droppings of a black bear and the droppings of a grizzly bear. Black bear droppings, maybe you didn't know this, black bear droppings are smaller and they contain lots of berries and fur. Grizzly bear droppings have little bells in it and they smell like pepper. <laughs> <laughs> or in other words, there are some things that are better left avoided altogether. Listen, you and I are not crazy to instinctively avoid troublesome confrontations. But what we're going to wrestle with today is, is what if? What if it would be better for you to face the trouble head on and more costly for you to try to avoid the trouble? If you're up for following along in God's word today. I'd love for you to do that. Find Matthew 10. This whole series, we're going to be in the words of Jesus, specifically when Jesus says, beware. You might remember that from last week. The be some beware statements from Jesus. In Matthew 10, Jesus is about to send out his 12 disciples. He's been mentoring these guys, and he's saying, guys, and this is true for all disciples of Jesus, you can do what I do. You've been watching what I do. I want you to do it as I do it. And so now he sends them out. In Matthew 10, he sends them out, and they're going to get a taste of what it's like to do gospel work, kingdom work. He's sending them out, and they're going to preach and authenticate the good news of the kingdom of heaven. And while they're doing it, Jesus forewarns them on how they will run into trouble. Look at verse 16. And we're going to work off of this passage for the rest of the morning. Matthew 10, 16 through 20. Jesus says, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be sh as shrewd as snakes and as harmless as doves. But beware, for you will be handed over to the courts. You will be flogged with whips in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be an opportunity to tell the rulers and other unbelievers about me. When you are arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time, for it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So his disciples are getting all geared up to show and share the most precious commodity in all of the earth. It's, it's the, the saving, healing, eternal love of Jesus. And Jesus says, but beware, not everybody's going to be delighted about this. Well, whenever Jesus says beware, the followers of Jesus prepare. And you and I today are going to prepare to keep being who he makes us, doing what he calls us to do, 
even if it means we have to endure some uncomfortable moments. And I want everyone to come along for the ride today. And so first I just want to acknowledge that there's a, there's a, a percentage of people in this room who are like, this is so on time for me. I get, I get frustrated. I've had these moments too. I get frustrated when a moment comes when I can answer a question about God or I get asked, you know, I get, I get a little dodgy about my faith because I just, I dread being misunderstood. I feel like if someone asks me a question about my faith or Jesus or my, my convictions, I'm going to fumble the ball. I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm going to lose credibility. And, and so what this tends to do is it, it kind of turns us into um, to Homer in the bushes. Those of you who send like GIFs back and forth over text, you might know what I'm talking about here. This is, you've seen this, this is... <laughs> This is, this is Homer. He's like, I don't think I can deal with this. And so he just kind of fades into the background. And, and this can happen when, when we don't have the confidence that God put us right there in that moment. He plans on us to be in that moment. There are people who say, look, I, I, I'm not sure I'm ready to face hostility or, or ridicule for Jesus. I, I, I don't think I could face injustice. I don't want to get canceled by other people because of the stance that I would take out of my convictions because of the God that I, I represent. And the sentiments of a few, a few people here who would be like, you know, lay it on me. I really need help in this department. Really, it really represents a great question for all of us. Is in your understanding of God, whatever it is, or I could say in your theology do you have a theology of suffering? In other words, is it built into your followership of Jesus that it might actually cause you problems? It might actually cost you something. Because the fact of the matter is, we follow God who came to earth, became man, and as a God-man lived a perfect life. Aced every test perfect life. He was beloved and honored for so many things that he said, so many things that he did, that he was, and still was treated maliciously to the point of being murdered. Do you deserve that? Well, no. But that Jesus lives in us. And that, this is not a secret. You know, Jesus said in John 15, he told his disciples, if the world hates you, just remember that the world hated me first. And the world would love you or they say they love you, <laughs> we won't cancel you. They say they, they will love you as one of their own if you belong to it, but you're not a part of the world. And you're not part of the world system anymore. You're part of my program. You're part of what I'm doing. I chose you to come out of the world, and so it, it hates you. I would, a, I would ask you today, so, so do you belong to Jesus? This is a great question. You know, when I'm doing the Ninja Warrior clinic with my kids and they got you climbing stuff and running over stuff and you're supposed to grab one rope and grab the other and you're kind of between the two, there, there, there are times in life where you're forced to make a decision and you got to put both hands on one rope. Are you a person that lets go of Jesus when it comes to ultimate safety or are you a person that both throws both hands on the Jesus rope? Jesus lives in us and so... If you're a person that would say, heart, mind, body, and soul, I belong to Jesus, then, then we're probably better off right now adjusting our expectations, right? And that's what we, want to, we, what we want to learn to do today is to say nope to this idea that when things get tough for us as Christians, we want to say nope to this idea that we have to fade into the bushes, that we have to buckle, or that we have to fold or we have to start living in the shadows. Nope, nope. Jesus is actually telling his disciples in, in Matthew 10, when trouble comes, don't run from it, embrace it. So I'm excited. I'm excited about what we'll get to unpack today. I want to talk to a few more people in the room before we dive in. And it's just a quick word for, for those of us here today who have not yet given your heart and life to Christ. And I would think that the question you're asking is, why? <laughs> Why? Like, aren't, aren't you taking this Jesus thing a little extreme, a little far? If we're talking about, like, beatings and ridicule and, like, why would you hang on to, can't you just stick it in your back pocket and be quiet about it? Can't you just, why would you throw both hands on that rope? 
And I, I, it's a fair question. I, I want you to come along for the ride today, too. And I just want to remind you, you know, I know that these moments, there are moments that come where you maybe feel like you're on the outside looking in. It doesn't mean you're in a bad spot. I love that you're here today. And I can tell you are actively engaging. You are imagining what it would be like for you, I hope one day soon, to give your whole heart and your entire life to Jesus. It's not a small thing. Jesus advised everybody, count the cost. Consider the cost. But to your question, why would we even be talking about this? The first thing I would say is that this, is that in this life, no matter where you go, if you don't stand for something, it's likely that you will fall for anything. There will always be wolves. We live in a broken world. No matter who you are and what you stand or don't stand for, you have to watch your back. That's just the laws of planet Earth. The difference for a Christian is that Jesus has given them a heads up that it, maybe it's not you. Maybe it's just because of the me that they see in you. And the difference for a Christian is that he promises he's going to guide us and guard us through those moments. And he always rewards us for any kind of heat that we take for belonging to him. That's, that's, that's really the only difference. And our why on how we look for those moments ahead of time and we stay true to Jesus, like when we put a ring on a finger and say, we call it ahead of time for better and for worse, right? The and is spoken up front. And the reason why this is our why is because we believe that everything that we have found in Jesus is worth our undying devotion to Jesus. Like, talk to the followers of Jesus in this room. All of the purpose and the hope and the healing and the comfort and the unexplainable peace and the answers and the guidance and the truth and the, the just precious promises that nobody can take away from us. Precious promises that will never fade away. Like all of this and more will, be end, up, this will end up being worth any discomfort that we experience in the middle. That's, that's why. And I, I, I think today would be an awesome day for you to be like, man, this is insane. I'm jumping in. <laughs> so... As you pace that out, we're all going to dive in right now. And my goal today is to raise our confidence about living and sharing our faith when it matters the most. All right? And so what we're going to see in Matthew 10 is five ways that Jesus equips us to keep sharing our faith no matter what. And I'm pretty confident that as we go, this is what you're going to see. Showing and sharing the love of Jesus with the people around you in your day-to-day -day life does not have to be complicated. It does not have to get weird, and, it, and you don't ever have to stop, okay? The way Jesus equips us to share his love with other people, number one, my walk, my walk. What this means is how you operate in everyday life. I would, I would look at verse 16 for this one. Jesus says, look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. Be as shrewd as snakes and as harmless as doves. Talk about going to the zoo. Like, you think maybe Jesus was walking through a zoo with his disciples? Oh, yeah, and that, but not that. Oh, maybe that. Yeah, all of it, you know. It starts off with Jesus saying, I'm sending you out. Because every Jesus follower is a sent person. What this means is that as you walk along, there ought to be an air about you. It's an air of confidence. It's an air of focus. It's an air of love you are a sent person every day, where you live, where you work, where you play. You are an everyday missionary for Jesus. And all of those filler moments, the vibe, if I can use that, it all counts. It all goes somewhere. You can share the love of Jesus with people in your walk. And so Jesus has a general strategy for this. He says, so be as shrewd as snakes and as harmless as doves. I I'm curious, how many people like hate snakes? Hate snakes so much you love to hate snakes. This is most of us, all right. Some of you, I can see your toes curling a little bit. You're like me and Indiana Jones, right? Like, oh, I hate snakes. A snake is a symbol of shrewdness, a symbol of craftiness. Apparently, the reason why is because that's the way God made them. Genesis 3 says that the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So listen, Jesus' disciples understood what Jesus was saying 
when he said, I want you to be as shrewd as snakes. But he also said, I want you to be as harmless, or your Bible might use the word innocent, as doves. Now, what's up with that? Well, here's what we know about doves. Like, I've never seen anybody pick a dove for their sports mascot. <laughs> right? Like, they ain't after nobody, right? They're not to get out to get anybody. What Jesus was saying is, in all you do as a sent person, you are to be quietly angling for more of heaven's light to break through. That you are, you are taking, taking, taking more ground. That's what shrewdness does. Always figuring, always angling, always leaning, always looking for the next opportunity. But harmless as doves, not in a selfish way that hurts people. Who are we taking for? We're not taking for us. We're taking for the kingdom of God. Like we, we want to see more and more and more people set free in Christ because we know anything is possible. We, we want to see heaven packed one day. So, shrewd as snakes, but as innocent, as harmless as doves. And in an often hostile world, that innocent shrewdness will lead us to do this very subtly. Have you ever been snuck up on by a snake? Like this. It's just like they're, this is what they do. Like where I come from, my biggest snake worries were just like garter snakes. But that's still a snake, okay? You Arizona folks, I don't want to hear your stories, all right? I really don't want to hear your stories. But I, I mean, there were times, you know, when I was 12, we had, a lot of, we had a lot of yard, and I'd be mowing. I'd just be locked in on what was playing on my Walkman. I will explain that later. But <laughs> And then you got the short grass and the really tall grass, and then, then a snake will not just shoot out, but it'll, like, spring out. And you're just like, ah! And they had the ability to sneak up on you. I was able to go back to mowing at some point, but I would have to sort of calm down, set my yard on fire. When the smoke clears, then maybe. And the thing, about, the thing about the subtlety of our walk is not that it's ever an unpleasant surprise, but it does sneak up on you, the goodness of God's people. To be a Christian and help other people go where God is leading you does not mean it has to be a full frontal assault with guns blazing. I think about the words that came to mind for me are just like noticing and awareness and remembering. That when you, when you, when you are a noticer in somebody else's life and you say, hey man, you got a new haircut, didn't you? Right? I notice you're in a real chipper mood today. I mean, they feel, people, people feel that selflessness and they go, oh, I didn't see that coming. Or our awareness just causes us to grab somebody's shopping cart for them or open the door for somebody and say, hey, that looks heavy. Let me help. You want some help with that? Or, or just remembering. It, it could be weeks go by and you go, hey, you were telling me about something your aunt was going through. How's she doing? Like, there are things in the walk of a Christian that become the bright spots of other people's day. This is how heaven's light gets through. So one way we share, Jesus equips us to share him is with our walk. Number two, with our works. With our works, what's this? These are the things that we do. Or here's another word I want to use. These are the things that we build that show the goodness of God and the love of Jesus to other people. In verse 18, Jesus told his disciples, I mean, you're going to stand trial before governors and kings because you're my followers. That's going to be your opportunity. No matter what the work is, Christians are workers for Christ and workers produce work. And the goodness of the things that you are building should line up with your faith and reveal our why. You know, it's Ephesians 2.10 that says that we're God's masterpiece. This is what he's doing in you. In you. He's, he's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us to do long ago. This includes everyday good works in the Target parking lot. In your neighborhood, your schools, your job, the places that you play, God's always working. He always is moving in other people's lives. He wants to use what you're up to in order to show his love and, 
and share his story. So, my, my walk. Secondly, my works. And these really can be any works. It doesn't matter if you bank. It doesn't matter if you softball coach. It doesn't matter if you landscape. Whatever it is you do, if you do it for Jesus and you, and you do it with the heart of Jesus, here's the thing. <laughs> Two softball coaches who work really hard, but one of them is doing it for Jesus with the heart of Jesus, the ripples you send in your softball coaching will last for eternity. And that's not true for the rest of our work. It just stays on this side of heaven. Or in 1 Corinthians 3, it kind of talks about one day all of us are going to turn our work in and it's all going to go through a crash test or like through the furnace. And the stuff that's been built with hay, wood, stubble, whew, that's what it all amounts to. But the stuff that's made out of gold, silver, precious gems, it lasts forever. God can use your works in order to get a heavenly message through. My walk my works. Here's the third one. I can share Jesus through my words. How many people here are part of the club of people? I'm in it. It's, it's the, oh, I know exactly what I should have said way too late. <laughs> oh, this would have been even funnier to say, you know, or oh, this would have shut down the argument, or oh, I know. And, and I feel like, I feel like so often, this can happen to us as we are living our lives. And then we sort of get stunned with a question like, um, hey, how come, how come you turn away when I'm telling dirty jokes? You know, or how come you're always busy on Sundays? Or, hey, how are you, how are you keeping it all together? Or, you know, how come, how come you never party with us? Or like, whatever the question will be. Have you ever frozen up in a moment like that? And you like, kind of like, like sort of took an easier road because you didn't want to be misunderstood and you didn't want to, um, you didn't want to come off as some holy roller or something like that. Now, let's be honest. Some of those questions we get, they're absolute layups. And, and still, there's something sometimes in our reflexes where we're, we're, we're just like, I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to screw this up. Your words carry power. It's pretty cool encouragement when Jesus promises, don't worry how to respond. You remember that? It was verse 19. He said, God will give you the right words at the right time. This tells us something really important, that God is with us in those moments. He still wants to use us. Even if, like Moses, we are like, you picked the wrong guy. I stutter. God's like, no, I know who I'm picking. I put you right where you are. And how sharing Jesus with somebody can be natural and supernatural at the same time. It's, it's supernatural because we have God saying, I will be with you. It's verse 20 that says, the spirit of, your, of God in heaven will be with you. He will tell you what to say and how to say it. That's how it's supernatural. How is it natural? Well, because he's using me. <laughs> he's using me, and I'm looking for just normal opportunities that naturally come along when we're in friendships, where we work, where we play, where we hang out. There's probably, pro I would imagine there's a few myths in every church about the guy who does this. One, one, of them, one of them is, oh, those moments don't come from that guy. He always knows exactly what to say. He's never deer in the headlights. He just, like, goes for it. And two, he probably delivers, like, a four-point answer that's, like, beautiful, you know, and it's got verse references. And I just want to tell you, neither of those are actually true. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a measure of trust. I'm doing a job here while we dive right into Scripture. We're out in that lobby. We've got these beautiful faith relationships. We can jump right in. And talk about, talk on a faith level. But listen, to my neighbors, I'm just Justin. I'm not Pastor Justin, where I hoop, where I work out. Like these, these people, I'm just Justin. And then, then I'm in more circles now because of my kids. They don't even know Justin. They just know Cooper's dad, you know, or Emery's dad, you know, or whatever. I never force a Jesus conversation in, in any of those places. But what I have also seen time and time again is as I naturally live life and share spaces and friendships with other people, these opportunities just come up. And I, I can give you story after story, but honestly, it's not because I'm a pastor. It's just because uh, I'm following Jesus. Maybe one day I won't be a pastor. I'll still be following Jesus. And the way that you live starts to earn you credibility in those relationships. I think about times in my neighborhood. I've lived in my neighborhood for eight and a half years now. And it's given me time to meet a lot of people. And the more you reach out, the more you hang out with them, the more 
something comes up. I remember neighbor three doors down. You know, we hang out all the time, and we, we, we say hi to each other all the time. He shared with me that his wife has cancer. And so there we are, standing, in, standing on the sidewalk, and he can, he's drawn in by my genuine concern to the point where I can see he's open enough, and I just, I just ask, hey, can we just, here's what I believe. Can we pray about it right now? It it's becomes a safe place to talk about things like pain and mortality and eternity. Trials and transitions. These are two key times in the lives of other people where the, where the opportunities just really bob to the surface. Uh, one that Courtney and I tend to get a lot of the times is the whole foster care thing. It just, the, the people, the, you can see their eyes rolling back like they're trying to make it fit. How, does, how do you welcome a kid in your home and love on them as if they're your kid, but then save space for the fact that they might not stay forever and that you actually want things to get fixed so they can go back? Like, how do you do that? And I answer those questions as simply as I can, but then there's a moment where the Spirit just tells me they're looking for a missing piece. Give them the missing piece. And I tell them, well, this is something that Jesus did to our hearts. He's still working on us, but this is something that, you know, this is a change that Jesus has made for us. These kinds of things deserve to be put into words. They deserve to be uh, prepared for and prayed ahead for. And you might say, well, wait a minute, didn't Jesus say, don't worry about that? <laughs> Just wait for the moment to come and God will take care of it? Here's what I want you to know, both. Jesus was saying, don't worry. He was trying to put their anxieties at ease. He wasn't saying never prepare, never imagine that this opportunity might come. A lot of those conversations, I've been hopeful and prayerful that maybe something somewhere, somehow would give us an opportunity. I think of like how First Peter 3 says that if anybody ever has a, a, a question for you, asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it and do it in a gentle and respectful way. Means you and I got to have some words and how we say it that will be the breadcrumbs that people can follow in order to get to Jesus. He's equipping us to share Him through our walk, through our works, through our words. Here's the fourth one through our wounds. And that's a wild one, right? Have you ever thought about receiving wounds for Jesus? I mean, man, this. This seems to be so outside of our reality, doesn't it? Like, it's 2024. We, we, we don't do public beatings or lynchings. You know, this is America. And Christians, let's never stop being grateful that we live in America, right? We worship freely. We worship publicly. We gather publicly. We can own a copy of the scriptures we can read the scripture. We can share our faith with our friends. And yet here we have Jesus saying, beware, you will be handed over to the courts. You will be flogged with whips in the synagogues. How do we, how we, how do we plan on reconciling the two in our lives? Well, first thing I would say is the very people he was talking to, those immediate disciples didn't face that the next five minutes. It didn't happen like tomorrow. However, this is the key. They were prepared for things to get physical. It's kind of a hard swallow. I mean, you take a lot of my stuff, but once you take my comfort, you take my health. Whoa, now, you know, like, they were prepared for that. In fact, history reveals that those very disciples went forward into ministry after Jesus handed them the keys. And most, all, like all of them, were put in positions because of their faith to the point that they were, they were, they were physically persecuted. They were, they were tortured. And almost all of them died a gri some kind of grisly execution because of their faith and their mission for Jesus. And I think it should beg the question for all of us. Am I that all in with Jesus? Like, like which rope? Like, I believe I would put myself in harm's way for my country. I believe I would, I would take the heat for, for my loved ones. Would I do that in my stand for Jesus? And is it going to happen tomorrow? I don't know. But should we prepare for that? Oh, yeah, it's part of the deal. It's part of the deal. And our wounds speak a message for Christ that is simply unavoidable to a watching world. 
And the devout followers of Jesus say, that would be a privilege. Think about when I was, I think I had just turned 20 years old when the, when the Columbine massacre happened, 1999. We actually had a gal who was in this church for, their family was in this church for a long season. She was part of that graduating class. She knew Cassie Bernal, who when one of the active shooters took another classroom hostage, he said, does anybody here believe in God? And she stood up and said, I believe in God. And he snuffed her, light right out, her life right out. She went straight to glory. Just because that level of persecution hasn't come our way, it's not normal in America, doesn't mean it never will. This should be part of our faith. What would you do? And, and I think if we never pause to imagine this happening to us, what we'll end up doing is we'll buy this lie that you and I as Christians are different. We're entitled to an injury-free life. And when we're given the chance to stand up and stand strong, we'll more likely do what? More likely back down. So, even when it comes to things like discomfort and pain, <laughs> we can still be sharing the love of Jesus. It might not take our life. It might take our job, though. Depending on our stand, we might take some hits. Is Jesus worth it? Is he the one rope that you cling to? My my walk, you got them all? My walk, my, my works, my words, my wounds. Here's the last one, my worship. We can share Jesus with our worship. Now remember that Jesus is speaking to disciples who had already left everything to follow him. Jesus' immediate audience is very clear. Jesus is numero uno, right? And that is the essence of worship. Understand this. Worship is not that moment when the drummer clicks off and the band all jumps in. Okay, his worship begins. Like if we were going to be specific about that, and sometimes I am, we call that musical worship. We call it corporate worship. But the kind of worship we're talking about right now is, is a moment-by-moment -moment allegiance to God that is expressed and exposed in your actions, and your priorities. That is 24-7, 365. God is number one. Worship. It's an allegiance to God that is expressed and exposed by our actions, by our priorities. The way that you push God to the front of your life, especially in difficult times, will reveal to other people the incomparable worth that you and I have found in following God, in belonging to Him. Think about a guy named Stephen in Acts 7, who while the first recorded martyr in the Bible for Jesus, while they rained stones down on him to end his life, <laughs> He'd say, okay, wait, wait, I take it back. Never mind. Now, Jesus is number one. He looked heavenward and prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So who do you worship? I think about Acts 16 when Paul and Silas, <laughs> out on mission, were unjustly jailed and beaten, whipped on the backs. And in the midnight hour, there they were in the inner cell, praising God loudly while their feet and their ankles were in the stocks and their backs were just oozing. You know, the same is true for us, is that when you and I, in the hardest of moments, when we lift up Jesus' name, people see who we're reaching out to, who we're reaching out for. I've been in this room so many times so many times experienced so many powerful moments of worship. But I got to tell you, some of the most powerful worships I've, moments of worship I've ever been a part of, I've ever witnessed, they've, they've been in hospital rooms. They've been at gravesides where they've been with people like members of this church family where we've wept and we've prayed and we've believed God for a rescue, for healing, for miracles. And listen, sometimes they come. Individuals of this church could tell you, even like kids, we weren't sure they were gonna make it. And they did. We got a yes, we got a green light, praise God. 
And then there's these other times where the miracle didn't come this side of heaven. They, they did receive their forever healing, but on the other side, in glory. And these families have the audacity to keep praising God anyway. They want scripture read at the graveside. They ask for these worship songs to be sung. And, and, it's, and it's, like, it's like when you're at the Peter Pan musical and it gets to the point where he can fly, he can fly, he can fly. And you're like, nah, ain't no, thing, ain't no such thing as pixie dust. And you spend the rest of the song looking for the cable. That's what it's like for the people who are, are watching you. Watch a grieving family stand and sing and cling to hope through their tears. And you can tell they're being held up by something. They're, they're holding on to something very real. It's a strong God who is responsive. He is good. He is loving. Even in the midst our most painful nightmares. So five ways, five ways Jesus equips us to share our faith. And I just want to round it off by saying, it's my walk, my work, my words, you got it. And I just want to round it off by saying, hey, beware of the lie that your belonging to Christ should ever remain a secret. Nope. Beware of the lie that representing Jesus is something that you're not good at. Beware of the lie that your confidence for this, your focus on this is unimportant. It is. It is. You are sent. You are chosen out of the world to be changed so that you can be sent back into the world to carry hope and carry healing to people that just are like, just like what you were, are, are, are where you were from. God may surprise you who he leads you to. You never have to fade back. And so what this is for us is we just gotta pray. Pray that God will infuse our faith with a kind of strength that we will find that sticking point. I want to pray for us for that. Lord, I pray that you will have used moments like these to help us make some decisions. I think today would be a great day for a next step. Jesus, I know you had this habit of saying things that tended to thin the herd, and I feel like that can still, that still can happen in 2024. We hear your voice, though. And we pray for you to intervene and shine your light in so much darkness around us. And you're like, okay, and then you send us. And we just want to agree with you. Today's a day of firestorms and hurricanes. Today is a day of, of wars and political unrest. You don't need... We don't need more Christians fading out of the picture. We need Christians standing strong. We need to express our faithfulness to you and express that faithfulness in the relationships that you've called us to. Father, I just wanna pray that help us, help me to walk consistently, to work constructively. Make us a people where you can accomplish heavenly, heavenly things through our words, even through our wounds, if need be. Show us how to worship you as the only God who is worthy, the only God who saves. We question today what we've been building. We question today where our courage comes from. We want to be part of your plan to pack heaven. We want to do it because we belong to you. We want you to help it feel natural that this is where we stand. And while we're all in a prayerful posture, I just I want to speak to, to those of you I spoke to earlier. and You're acknowledging, yeah, I'm still on the outside looking in. I 
wouldn't be here if I didn't care. I'm still kind of kicking the tires, though. Hey, can I just ask you if there's a pull on your heart? I mean, you might say, yeah, you didn't really make it very attractive to become a Christian today. <laughs> And the, the, the crazy thing is, is that we serve a powerful God who continues to speak to us even in the most unlikely of moments and the most unlikely of times. And today might be the day when you're just realizing, I still think it's worth it. I still think that if I had to choose one rope, it would be Jesus. I, I want to encourage you to make that move because in the very same verse, Jesus said, hey, don't, don't fear those who can kill the body. Fear him who can kill the soul. Same chapter, Jesus says, hey, for those who are unashamed of me before men, I will be unashamed of him to my Father in heaven. If today's the day to cross the line, here's where you put your trust. You trust in the idea that you don't belong in heaven with sin. And we all sin. The Bible's clear about that. But you bring that guilt to Jesus and you also put your trust in the fact that he hung on the cross and died. He hung on the cross and died to pay the penalty for all sin, all sinners. If you've got another plan to wash yourself completely king, clean before all of heaven, I'd love to hear your plan. I don't think you got one. Jesus is the one who came before we asked him to and said, I will draw all men. If, you, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. I will bring them before the Father. I'm the way and the truth and the life. And what you can say is, God, I admit it. I'm a sinner. I need help. And I'm trusting in the life that you lived in my place and the death that you died in my place for eternal belonging in the family of God. I want to be washed clean and forgiven. I want to know that I've got a home in heaven. I want that to be my insur assurance and I want that to change how I live today and tomorrow. It's a free gift. Are you accepting that from him? That's how you cross the line. Jesus, be my savior. Be my Lord. From this point forward, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. From that point forward, it's all about what he's done, not what you can do. He will be with you every moment. Lord, I thank you for the ease at which we approach you, the grace that you have for us when we've dropped the ball. And I pray that you'd fill us with a fresh can-do spirit because of your power. And it would change the way we go out to our families, to our neighborhoods, to our cubicles, our offices. Thank you, Lord Jesus.